has a relationship with. I do not ask on behalf of the world. You notice what Jesus is saying? Let's leave the world out of this. So you got to understand, I'm talking about the Lord prepared for the sacrifice. Leave the world out of this. But for those whom thou hast given me, for they are thine. And then he goes on and says in verse 10, And all things that are mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I have glorified them. Verse 11. And I am no more in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep them in... He's talking about the Christians. He isn't talking about the world. Keep them in thy name, the name which thou hast given me. In other words, he will keep us in the name of Jesus, that they may be one, even as we are one. Now, you really got to think about that. The Christian church is not one in Christ. You are one in insanity. Verse 12, while I was with them, Jesus said, I was keeping them in thy name, which thou hast given me, and I guarded them. And not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus makes it clear that his death is only effectual to the ones that apply his life in their lives. If Jesus Christ is not applied in your life on a daily basis, he died in, in vain on Calvary. I mean, if you just see his death on Calvary as some event in history without humbling your heart, to bow the knee to him, then there's something wrong. In verses 13 through 20, Jesus' final prayer in the face of his disciples assures them that his ultimate concern was for their redemption, beginning with verse 13. But now I come to thee. These things I speak to the world. These things I speak in the world, that is, that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them thy word. Now look what he says. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask, I do not ask thee to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Let me pause right here. Those of you that were with me Thursday, you heard me give a discourse on this verse. Jesus says, no, God, don't take them from the planet. No, God, leave them in the pressure of that marriage relationship. No, God, leave them in the pain of the arthritic conditions that they have. No, God, we're going to let them stay on the planet where fallen sin has affected them. I don't want you to take them out of the world. I want you to keep them from the evil one while they're in the world. So what Jesus is saying, I am thinking about my church when I'm up in heaven, but I'm not going to release them from the tension of daily living. Don't come to Jesus at Easter time thinking that he's going to make your life a Easter bunny and a candy egg. No, you're going to crack that sucker and it's going to be rotten at times. You're going to go to the candy box and it's going to be empty at times. You're going to go to the checkbook and it's going to say minus 200 and the man's going to be knocking on your door trying to take your car from you. And you're still in Christ. But sometimes some of us think that we're in crises. What you're supposed to do when he's knocking on the door to take the keys, meet him and let him have it. And then you can worship him on Easter. My Lord, man, you know, these are wonderful, wonderful verses here. Jesus is really speaking to us. Look what he also says. He says in verses uh, 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Is that you? Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is true. As thou didst send me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. What did you do this, this, this so-called Easter week for Jesus? <laughs> Some of your children were out of school. Did you take the time to sit down and take them through the pertinent scriptures that discuss our Lord's death, burial, and resurrection? Or did you rush them through the madness of your week? Jesus says, and for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on the behalf of these alone. Now he's coming to us 20th century Christians. He says, but for those also who believe in me through their word. Jesus is speaking to us now. That they may all be one, even as thou, Father, are in me, and I in thee, and they also should be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst sense me. This is why the world does not believe in Christianity. We are one. I am in awe. Listen, I, I am in shock that in a Christian church where Jesus reigns, that a clique could exist. 
It frightens me to even think that Christians could be in cliques in God's church. If you're in a clique, you're in rebellion against the Holy Spirit and you need to repent. If you only got a certain group of folk that you want to run out and hang out with, you must be the devil bunch. <laughs> because Christians run out and hang out with everybody. If you have a home fellowship and somebody comes by that was not invited, your heart grows larger. You don't say, what are they doing here? <laughs> and if they come by and you just got the last plate and there's none for them, you're supposed to give it to those folk. Thoroughly Christian. Clicks in the church. Jesus said, no, I don't want him to be like that. And so we see very plainly what these verses teach. There can never be complete sacrifice unless our disposition of attitude is one of total sacrifice. God demands no less. If I say that the lamb prepared for the sacrifice, here's the issue for us on Easter Sunday morning. Are our lives a prepared life for sacrifice? Especially one towards the other. Man, I'm going to tell you something. You know what? I told you last week, and I'm saying, you know, when I think about, you know, Christ dying on Calvary for me and all that blood being shed on that cross, ripping him up, the man hung up there, butt naked, nothing on him, people spitting at him, beat him all upside his head. Man, an ugly sight, an ugly sight. And we come to church like we're doing God a favor. We need to all fall out when you think about what he's listening individually when you think about what Christ did for you you should have been in the mirror like me this morning looking at yourself almost even up God how can you put up with me thank God he didn't answer through the mirror <laughs> thirdly let's look at the lamb passionately betrayed and left helpless first I said the lamb proposing his own method of sacrifice secondly he prepared for the sacrifice now he is passionately betrayed in other words when the devil comes against him, Jesus lets it come on him with a passion. Let's go to the book of Luke now. Let's go to the book of Luke, and we want to look at Luke chapter 22, verses 1 through 6. Luke chapter 22, verses 1 through 6. And we're going to start with verses 1 and 2 first, because I see that the lamb is betrayed by one of those in his own company, to others that had hidden agendas. Jesus was betrayed by some folk in his own company to somebody else that had a hidden agenda. Man, can't you see the parallel in the Christian church today? If you do anything in your Christian life, listen church, if you do anything in your Christian life, to betray or to hurt another believer, especially when that other so-called person that you're doing that has a hidden agenda, you're just as bad as Judas. Now let's deal with these verses here. There were others always seeking to splatter some blood. Look at verse 2. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how they might put him to death but they were afraid of the people. Here we see Jesus saying, hey, listen, I just wasn't betrayed on a little, uh, on a chump charge. This was a passionately done thing. These men were constantly seeking how to kill the man, and Jesus knew it. And he allowed one in the group to be used of the enemy. What a paradox. I don't understand this to this day. I also see in verses 3 and 4 that there will always be some close to Jesus who for reasons of their own will not confide in his care. Look at verses 3 and 4. And Satan entered into Judas. Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. Friends, when betrayal comes in in the Christian life, Satan enters you. You Christians, think with me. You Christians that have your mind made up about how you're going to do life, how you're going to, how you're going to trick some folk, how you're going to try to maneuver your world. Satan enters you if you allow it. And listen, let me tell you something. If you see God doing something and God is doing something in a miraculous way, 
It escapes me where it is in the scriptures, but Jesus' disciples came to him and said, Lord, these men are saying this, these men are saying that. Are they right? Jesus said, if they're not against me, they're for me. Sometimes you can see somebody in the church, two or three people doing the same thing. Or well, it's going to be great for you to see the youth leaders working together. You watch their faces when they come out with the youth today. You know whether the youth leaders are working together. Or you see hypocrisy. Because I'm going to be sitting right in the front row looking in the faces. Judas on Easter? Oh, Pastor John, you're supposed to preach us into the flowery happiness. I'm telling you that this was an exceptional, busy, and bloody thing. And some of our lives are bloodier than that. I look at verses 5 and 6. The result of seeking to shed blood of the innocents is joy. It's joy. Look at the result when you seek to be that way. And they were glad and agreed to give the old boy money, my translation. And he consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray him to them apart from the multitude. I want you to know that the Easter event was something where men got together and did the nasty together. The nastiest thing in the world is to betray Jesus. See, you think I was talking about that old sex. No, sex ain't nothing compared to this. See, my friend, you can go out and have an adulterous affair and possibly still get to heaven. You do this, <laughs> you're going to join your brother Judas. So when you begin to betray people, especially godly people, beware, Jesus was passionately betrayed and left helpless. The ultimate purpose of Satan is to have the believer believe that God is helpless. The ultimate objective of the devil, especially at Easter time, is to show a church that is helpless and devoid of anything. My wife and I do this every Easter. We go to a major mall and walk. We don't go to buy anything. We go to walk. And I went in a shoe store because I was looking at these shoes and, that I liked, and I took my wife in to check it out with me. Not to buy them, but just to check them out. And there was a whole family in there. And you know the daddy was a drug dealer. You can tell the way they dress. Even all of his boys had beepers and telephones on them. <laughs> beep, beep, beep. I said, look at the drug money. Drug money buying this stuff. Little boy, little boy, no bigger than one of these little youngsters. And the store man came, oh, those shoes are $85. I said, what? Baby shoes, $85? And they was all dressed in the latest hip-hop clothes and looking all good. I said, this for Jesus? And you know they was partying all last night. And this morning, they made, they sitting in somebody's church. And the reverend had seen him once or the two times a year, and he goes, oh, it's good to see Brother Bop Wright. Brother Bop Wright's going to heaven. I know he, 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 he ain't here, but God loves all his children because he was early one Sunday morning. <laughs> Got your Bop Wright right, right? Sacrificing blood shed has a way of causing one to shy away from certain events, my friends. And I'm telling you, when I see Jesus being betrayed by Judas, and when I think about all this blood getting ready to get shed here in a little moment, I see a time for me to try to escape. See, it was to be that very thing that draws us to God. You see, we don't let the cross run us away from God. We use that to draw us towards him. Go to John chapter 12, verse 32, and then you see what I mean. John chapter 12, verse 32. Out of the mouth of Jesus, we will let him speak to us about this very important event. Jesus says, and if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto myself. And I think you better read verse 33 on your own to see that you know what he was talking about. Jesus said, oh, no, 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 no. I got to be lifted up. Now, he don't mean like some folk use this. Lift up the name of Jesus. No, he don't mean that mess. That's what's going on in churches now. Lift up the name of Jesus. Lift up the name of... No, 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 no. He said, if I be lifted up. He was talking about Calvary. He wasn't talking about lifting up his name. See, that's what's happening when you're going in these churches. They're lifting up the name of Jesus. That doesn't bring salvation. Lift him up, bloody, naked, and filthy. 
that brings you to salvation. 